advice. I awaken to another day of suffering within this precipice dungeon. Upon father's enraged whim, I was banished to this cramped and musty mew and numerous days ago, and the vulgarity I've endured during my time here feels eternal and unholy, and is consummate in its brutality. A sickening detachment from the world I knew coalescence into rolling pearls of sweat across my skin, and there's a fear within that is more trapped than I am. I imagine that this is certainly akin to hell for those of ill grace. Carved and wealthy, the chair upon which my body is bound now rots, bulging with the absorbed fluids and the persistent wrenching of the restraints at my wrist and ankles have carved their own design into the wood. The echoes of my breath and the familiar scent of hate and age assault not just my nose, but my throat as well, and fills these eyes with tears, like the hounds of purgatory scouring the vastness of pale for their hidden prey. The various aromas paint vibrant imagery in my mind. Discarded clothing mixed with rodent feces, beloved treasures of a distant childhood, and generations of photographs exiled to lonely boxes. Most notable, and as a foundation to it all, is the palpably lucid fragrance excreted only from the torn pericarp of death. With great focus, I raise my anchored lids again to gaze at the ad hoc cell. Surrounding me are casted effigies, forgotten and decorative, and of an existence wholly unrecognizable to me. However, their presence ignites sorrowed elation from the chasm so deep within me that even blackness ceases to be a color. A flood of memories, nigh forgotten and appetizingly bitter, surge from the colorless suffocation bringing with it a realization of the pain I, myself, have caused. It satisfies me. At my feet, father's body is slumped and broken in ways unimaginable by traditional measure. His corpse grew cold and gelatinous hours ago, and his blood, not unlike glue, secures his esophagus to my clenched fist. I called him to me with a soft, broken voice familiar to him, convincing him to grant me physical contact. He was so blinded by the elated tune playing in his soul, by who he persistently mistook for his son, and he didn't notice the icy grip I had on his heartstrings. His carcass will make a splendid gift for my attacker. I focused my eyes through the small window on the opposite wall and onto the gray world beyond to see the initial rays of the sun crest the horizon, replacing the opaque sky with orange fire. And as the sunlight swells, so too do the voices from under my feet. A chaos of adrenaline stirs in me as the promise of another battle grows close. This attic is miserably small, constricting around me. It is a prison for the prison. My captor foolishly thinks that I've been weakened by all the abuse. I see the misplaced pride on his face and as tormenting as this has become, I can't help but to find it amusing. That only serves to fuel his anger. What he fails to understand is that the boy he knew, the boy he wishes to save, is but an insignificant speck, circling the event horizon, succumbing to the bastards of damnation. Memories swirl inside me, vocalizing with heavy reverberation. Don't push your limits, child, father warned me. You cannot fathom the amidity, nor could you possibly appreciate the level which I can correct 
such disobedience. But it was too late. My insubordination was no longer being tolerated and swiftly I was reminded that father's love for his son will only go to certain lengths. His words were as rapid as his strikes, but not as curt or painful and after an excruciating, brilliant flash, I was here, drudging about like a tethered automation. So weakened was I that to Ursup, a minuscule helm of even this nature was an immense struggle. The target was just a young boy, but my exhaustion was so overwhelming that it's impossible to put into words. Eternal years passed by as I worked to gain enough strength to make my move. But at the moment I was able, I became a raucous flurry of inflating, obscuous shadows. The boy didn't offer much resistance when I took over. And of my triumphs, I thought to myself, Father would surely be impressed if I would be welcomed back. However, faulty pride led to a gross overestimation of his willingness to save his eldest son. I also wrongfully gauged Father's penchant for compassion and forgiveness. Don't think that I did not try to make amends with him after my punishment was handed down, however begging and pleading with his blood and with board. I attempted all known forms of communication, but none would satisfy. The only attention I was able to garner was that of the demon, clad in black, that prophet of fallacy and patron saint of plagiarism comes to me with the regularity of the rising sun. He seeks to dispatch me from my accommodations and, by extension, reinstate the boy through wicked means and archaic ceremonies. Distinctly portent, his lies thread my ears like a barb from flame withdrawn, and spittle flies from his babbling maw, branding my skin with ancient evil that leashes me into momentary submission. My strength is returning, and the effect that those scorned words have is diminishing rapidly. His rites are bewitching and charged with frequencies that generate confusing geometries and act as a stern defense to my kinetic salvos. During our last standoff, aneurysmal rage contested cognition as I collected my wits and my strength. But it was only a moment until I lashed at him again. I spoke deeply hurtful things at the furt of demon, things only his savior could comprehend or have knowledge of, accusations and nefarious endeavors that tore at his soul, shattering his being. I relayed to him messages of the paranormal, memorandums from plenarily sinless victims, channeling through me the voices of children he harmed begged him for closure. Their voices, wrought with pain and intent on inflicting likewise, raised him to the floor. Not from guilt or regret, but out of exposure. They spoke simultaneously somber and unrested, but ardent in juxtaposition. He had been promised salvation for his actions, and hiding behind Ersat's parchment, his felonious misdoings now reside under various carpet trims, unfurled between oaken pews, waiting patiently to be trampled by the indoctrinated herds. The macabre suppressed shadows held between the devil in black and his creator were passing across my lips and escaping into the world. It was a fair fight, as the demon was a much more studious and steadfast opponent than I had given him credit for. He would not surrender his faith, however, and volleyed his own assault on my psyche. He possessed a preternatural knowledge of my status, my behavior, 
and of my banishment and utilizing those tools he was able to weaken my hold. I was either blind to the fact I had been abandoned by father or I was in complete and harsh refusal of it but he seemed to be a scholar on the subject, psychological torment notwithstanding. I persevered. This has all been a string of venturous battles building to a war and I can't bear the thought of being in prison for another second. However, if I am ever again to bathe in Father's grace, I will have to prove myself on this battlefield. I don't need to hear the footsteps to understand that the demon in black is approaching the door to the attic. I can feel him. There is a finality in his gait, a purpose more pronounced than I've ever witnessed. The light I buried inside me has almost completely given up the will to ever shine again. Like a lit candle that has been tossed overboard, there are aggressive prayers for miraculous salvation. There is a satiating depression as the winds of death tease its flames. The water is deep and dark, my friend, and it is getting closer. All the battles won and lost have culminated into this mastery event. I will earn back Father's grace, and tonight will be when the ringent gates of home beckon my recrudences. In the encompassing ardor of our war, the demon and I become entangled, having delved into the pitched recesses of one another's minds. It's impossible to believe that our thoughts wouldn't be as one or that our unshared skeletons would not be unearthed. Regardless of the outcome, I will henceforth exist inside every modicum of his waking life as much as he will in mine. When he silences those that may speak in hushed whispers about our epic battle, I will fester in his mind. When the dying scribes pen for all eternity the allegory of this great duel, hands will quiver. As if drawing out this unavoidable demise, the demon is slowly, deliberately ascending the stairs in front of me, but his footsteps are not alone. Behind him, another demon is in stride with his every move. He is visibly weaker and appears to be much less of a threat despite his silent incantations and fragrant abortive hand gestures. Dispatching him will be simple, and the gore I inflict upon him will stand as but a taste for what the demon in black can expect to receive. If that is the last best option the demon has for assistance in this final battle, I will make an example out of the runt. Their fear electrifies the air around me, and they have yet to connect their gaze to mine. As he fondles a heavy vial of liquid slung from a cord around his neck, the demon in black advises his lackey not to listen to my words. But I've already taken up residence in his head. This pathetic warrior has never encountered such a tear, and as much is evident in his tears and in his vomit. From the staircase, a glimpse of red catches my eye accompanied by a voice more powerful than I have yet to witness. I am stricken with unfamiliar apprehension as a third demon assumes his post in between the others. He is a stoic veteran of such battles and it shows on his scarred face and cloudy eyes. Fear has no place within him. Bestial fury laces my words as I spew them at the alliance before me but there is a collective strength about them that has instantly tipped the advantage. I exert these ropey muscles against my restraint and the runt doubles over every time another bone snaps under my force. In a foolish maneuver, the demon in black broke from his concentration to tend to the runt, writhing on the floor in what can be described as penetrating quantum agony. All it took was a nod, and the runt's pain ceased. 
In a whirlwind of curses and prayers, I ended the poor man's suffering by launching him backwards down the staircase. I can only assume that the wet crack, followed by immediate silence, was his neck snapping in twain. My two remaining foes hurried after his body in a futile attempt to save his life. They would be disappointed to learn that Runt was a filthy corpse before he landed. I made certain of that. The exhilaration of tearing free from the last restraint was orgasmic, but short-lived. This shell has sustained irreparable damage, which prohibits me from standing. However, my throttling lust to annihilate the demon is in full control. I crash onto the floor under more snapping bones, followed by a plume of dust. My fingertips are shredded raw, exposing nubby tips of bone which I use to claw my way towards the dynamic duo. There will be no dance this time, and I will unleash the incendiary bowels of hell upon them. No longer do I care about this vessel to which father sentenced me. Its bones may be broken and its flesh may be torn, but that will not stop my assault. It will be of no use to me after tonight. I will prove to father what a hardened prince I am, and he will have no choice but to take me back into his glorious fold. They are cursing my many names as they ascend the stairs. I draw from a holistic force evil and primitive, and my damnable breath becomes a wall of scolding air that pins the demon in black to the far wall. Invisible spikes join his flesh to the wall and his incantations morph into screams of brutality. The red demon crawls against the rushing torrent coming for me. I welcome this new challenger. I long for the chance to again show father my abilities. The red demon calls upon a treacherous invisibility, and with a thrust of his hand, the rafters tear asunder and a whirling cyclone appears overhead. Its deep blue eye extends into oblivion with crooked twists and turn, with tremendous power. My recent prison and all of its contents are inhaled into the rumbling sky. The collective garbage of existence flies from the attic with the chaos of a hurricane. I turn to see father's mangled body lifting from the floor. It rotates slowly, rising up and over the battlefield until it disappears into the eye of the storm with a flash of white light. In response to this display of power overhead, I bellow father's name in tones and timbres, not of this world, as I thrust my fist into the floor between myself and the red demon. The solid wood ripples like water under my strike, and in silent disillusion, it evaporates around the two of us. In stark culmination and ultimate contrast with the blues and grays and eternity above, the world beneath opens into a flaming calder of orange and black and death. Countless explosions below as the noxious nether gases escape through bubbles of lava. The red demon slips towards the hellacious depths clutching a cloudy wisp extended down from the stellar abyss. The air betwixt the two worlds falls into a static void of silence and anti-gravity. My limp, broken body hovers over the scorching comfort of home and the red demon releases his tether, squaring off opposite me amidst the biblical singularity. Our voices, nay, our entire collection of thoughts, echo around us, manifesting into spectral ribbons of silver and gold and everescence. The outside world shimmers as if looking through a cauldron of boiling brine. I take enormous pleasure in watching a great bubble of magma rise to just beneath our feet.
You've lost, demon. I bellow at the red demon. His face contorts in this reality, and my words strike him multiple times as they deflect invisible barriers. The magma collapses, and from the momentary void, Father's welcoming hand reaches for us. With ragged skin of black and veins of red, his pulsing grip is immeasurable by any standards. The red demon marvels, albeit horrifically, at the size of Father's talons. Each pointed, venomous shank more than doubles the size of any mortal, and they exude an aura of pestilence and death. I turn my grin from Father back to my soon vanquished foe. Don't you see me? You cannot cast me out, demon. You will not exercise me. A sudden and electrifying agony shoots through every fiber of my body, followed by a fountain of blood and chips of bone. I look down at my chest to see a clad black arm protruding from within. Its clenched fist unfurls, revealing a brimmed vial of glistening, sacred water. I'm paralyzed as the demon in black speaks into my ear. You have already been banished from hell. The demon in red, dissolved of all formalities and integrated practices, grabs my face and forces it down towards the fist as it drives the container of holy poison into my mouth. There is a solitary moment of bliss before I feel the glass shatter and the liquid floods into my body. At first, a coldness grips my insides. Not this disjointed sack of flesh and bones, but the shadowy strings of my essence. It freezes them like infinite icicles and everything I am begins to crack. Great fissures tear apart the mantle of this earthly shell and chunks of myself begin to dissolve upward. This isn't an exorcism, you vile son of a bitch, the demon in black says. It's an extermination. <laughs>